Hello and welcome to this video on making your own ancient Egyptian beer. While we can't guarantee its ability to help build world wonders, we can guarantee it is an interesting and unusual recipe. A beer is one of the earliest, if not the earliest, of fermented beverages. Throughout the ages it has varied from a heady brew that was consumed to drive away emotions, lighter beers that made water safe to drink, and mildly alcoholic piss that comes in a can swilled at frat parties. Being one of the earliest known examples of beer, the Egyptian recipe is slightly different from all of these in some respects. This creates a good news bad news situation. Good news is that you don't require any ancient esoteric equipment or ingredients to make it work, although we do at least have archaeological evidence as to what they were. Bad news is that it has a somewhat unique taste that may not be to everybody's liking. The common name for beer in ancient Egypt was Heket. It's also sometimes pronounced as Hekt or Henket. There's also the name Tenmu, although Tenmu or Tenmu was more a relationship to the god associated with beer brewing rather than the name itself necessarily and may only have been used in certain circumstances. There are also a range of names for specific subsets of beer, much like we have today, where you have, for instance, ale and lager, but then you have various types again that each get their own distinction. After all, not all beer is the same. There is also the fact that, much like the modern world, beer in ancient Egypt was generally classified according to both its alcoholic strength and to a certain extent its flavour. In ancient Egypt, ancient beer tended to be somewhere between 3 and 4% alcoholic, although those used in religious ceremonies, festivals, or for other unusual reasons, let's say, had a higher alcohol content and up to 10% alcohol by volume. These were also generally considered to be of better quality. Something that should come as no surprise if you're familiar with history was a notable missing ingredient in ancient Egyptian beer. The hops. The hops weren't used until well into the medieval age, and at that point in time, we're well outside of ancient Egypt. There's also uh, some differences in the grains that were used. The important distinction here, for at least for our purposes, is that ancient grains would have had a very high protein content by comparison to modern varieties. Modern varieties of wheat and barley have a much more sugar content, but much lower protein content. And as a result, you could argue that it's not going to be exactly the same no matter how you make it today for the most part, but you're going to get as close as you can. Archaeological evidence from the time has a surprising amount of depth to it, whether that is the process to make the beer or the things that have been added to it. These are found on various engravings, paintings, murals and similar. There have also been uh, tiny dioramas found in various tombs. These tell us a lot about what was added to it, how it was made, and to a certain extent what the results would be. The actual process used for brewing and has been tested by researchers since is a two-stage mashing process. The first is that you have a fermenting vessel, and this should be semi-porous. The reason you want semi-porous is that it will contain much of the yeast culture that will be used to ferment everything. The importance about a two-stage mashing process is that the first step is a cold mash, and this is going to involve malted ground grain. Similar to what we would do with boiling for mash today, they instead did by using this cold water or room temperature water and malted grain. This allowed them to get all the active enzymes they wanted, and it would convert all of the starches into fermentable sugars. The second mash, which is the second stage, is also going to be done at the same time, so this is a multi-person process, but it has unmalted grain. When you combine these two, you get hot water that is able to activate those enzymes and begin breaking down the unmalted grains. This is the same basic process as boiling for modern brewing for beer, it's just done slightly differently. The mash itself is then heated up, and by uh, combining the two, you have the enzyme activity convert everything you can, and then as it cools down, it's sieved through uh, a cloth of some description, directly into that vessel that's semi-permeable or porous. That's generally made out of terracotta, although there are other examples. This creates a warm solution in a vessel that's been impregnated with yeast, and it will now begin being able to ferment itself. It's then covered with something like cloth, and it's left alone for however long it takes to stop bubbling. 
There's likely to have been a uh, well-established colony of yeast within each vessel that would allow the brewery to know roughly how long each time it would take. We've touched on why the ceramic vessel is so important. We've touched on just why it is that a terracotta, most likely, vessel is so important. It is the porosity of the inside surface. But the second reason is that it is going to be quite cool to the touch. That is, by comparison to the ambient environment and the ambient temperature, importantly, you're not going to have the same transfer of heat. If you did, in something like Egypt, where it gets quite hot, you would find that the contents of the vessel got too hot too quickly, leading to off flavours and possibly production of methanol. The terracotta, to a certain extent, avoids this issue and ensures a more stable temperature for the entirety of the fermentation. It also has a slightly unexpected side effect as well. Whilst for the most part the inside is porous, it's also slightly absorbent, so it will absorb some of the water within the solution, and then this will pass through the terracotta and then evaporate out into the local environment. This helps to cool the terracotta pot, which is an additional bonus feature in something like Egypt which is quite warm. If you use the uh, more traditional Egyptian recipe, that is something high in protein and similar, you are going to make a beer that is rich in acids, ketones, esters, hydrocarbons, terpenes, nitrogenous compounds, aromatics, and only a small amount of alcohol, or at least that's what some archaeological evidence have found. There is, however, quite a bit of variation, and to be quite blunt about it, most of it is based on a homogenous and basic brew. As with modern brewers, who are at a craft or microbrewery level, brewers in ancient Egypt experimented extensively. Sometimes it was simple things like adding fruit. Other times, more unusual items like olive oil, cheese, and vegetables. In extreme cases, it was narcotics or narcotic-containing plants, like opium poppies. This is also going to have a carry-on effect what the beer is like. To be quite blunt about it, ancient Egyptian beer recipes tended to be more medicinal in nature than you might expect. They were very concentrated and almost like a tea in how they had extracted a lot of the flavours. This meant you had a lot of malt sweetness and, in some cases, a lot of alcohol. Due to the addition of herbs as well to flavour this, they could also be uh, quite interesting. Sometimes sour, sometimes very herb-like, and sometimes it's almost like you had just consume some sort of spiced beverage. To make your own Egyptian beer, you're going to need the following by volume. One part barley, one part wheat, one part honey, and one part water. Yeast is where this is going to be the challenge, as unlike ancient Siberian viruses, bacteria, and similar, there are no handy frozen specimens to rely on, so you're going to have to try and decide for yourself what sort of beer you're going to derive. Do you want to make something more in line with an ale or a lager? A lager will convert more of this into alcohol, and therefore you'll likely get an alcoholic beverage, whereas a ale yeast is likely to convert less of it and create a somewhat lighter sort of beer. To do it, you're going to combine your barley, wheat, honey, and water in a large pot. Ideally, grind the barley and wheat down to a point where you can create a almost dough-like texture. To this, you then want to add water until it's completely diluted, and you add your yeast to it. You now should have something closer to a, almost like a syrup, if not slightly less than a syrup, more close to water. Stir it and cover it in your pot for about 10 days, although it can take as little as 4. It depends a lot on environmental conditions and your choice of yeast. After the fermentation is completed, and you can tell this by the fact that it no longer bubbles, you want to bottle the contents. We do first suggest, however, giving it a cold crash to remove any of the sedimentation and drop it to the bottom of your pot. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of sediment in the bottles that you are going to fill. You want to keep this in a cool, dark place, as unlike modern beer, which, particularly with the addition of hops, tends to store better for longer, this will not. Also, rather than a pot, we do recommend a fermenter, but if you want to be more authentic to the ancient methods, the use of a pot will work just as well, but be aware that it does carry slight more difficulties in terms of possible contamination and, well, you are definitely going to be smelling your beer brewing the entire time. You are likely to find that, since this is a relatively a strong brew across the board, that is, you have very little things that are going to get in the way of fermentation, 
you're going to get a fair amount of alcohol and a fair amount of free sugar. This is one reason why ancient beer was about 10% alcohol and had a very sweet taste. You can consider it in some respects similar to a modern strong beer, just not as potent. There are, at least as far as the archaeological and historical record go, over 100 different recipes for medicines that all included beer from ancient Egypt, and if it wasn't included explicitly in ingredients, many other medicines strongly suggested that a patient would consume beer, as it would gladden the heart. There was also a religious aspect to this, or perhaps it would be better to say spiritual aspect, in that beer was thought to confuse evil spirits, which we just think nowadays is called being drunk. The ancient Egyptians did have a slightly more pragmatic view about it, however. That is, that if you confuse the evil spirits, and these cause diseases, somebody would get better. There's also evidence to show that at least at a religious level and a mystical level, it was thought that you could call upon the god, and particularly set in this case, to empower beer, and that would further support the use in disorienting and perplexing spirits so that an individual could recover. While the methods, products, and results of ancient brewing might not have survived to today in their truest form, their derivatives have. Certainly, if you combine frat parties and Budweiser, you get idiots. But beyond that mystifistical, magical creation of dumb, we do, however, see other things that it does do. It is a likely predecessor to something like modern sour beers, or wheat beers, and similar that have strong flavours, high alcohol, and a resemblance to something like black tea. We also have it associated, and certainly partly to attributed to the development and production of the Great Pyramids of Giza, the things that have survived today very clearly. Less clear are some of the other developmental pathways. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.